Welcome. This is a November 16th Beehive call. We have Jan, Andrew, Hans, Goran, John, and myself, Michael. Happy FreeBSD 14 release to those who celebrate. That should land any hour now. And missed out on the last call. There was a handbook rewrite that we should have mentioned yesterday, but do take a look at the jail handbook rewrite. I've got a link in the doc. And Antrenigl, who will hopefully drop in, has found that he cannot wire more than about one and a half terabytes of RAM. So hopefully he has some news on that. Uh, Jan's S6RC tour will have to get kicked down the road. And same with Antrenig's run it tour because he hasn't rolled in. So Hans, uh, let's talk time counters. It sounds like something you might have some uh, time and ability to work on. Well, it's been a year since I last looked at this. So. I pretty much need to uh, get into this first. Um, I do have a bit of time on my hands right now. Okay. So um, basically, I can start looking at this again if if there's an interest in that. Um, I'm not sure I have hardware that is modern enough for this, but uh, I do have an Intel and an AMD system, which both run Beehive. It's just that they're a couple of years old. I don't know whether anything changed with the time counter hardware wise that would be relevant. how old an amd system uh the amd system is, is 10 years old oh okay it's a um, bulldozer system okay got it um i uh, i could in theory give you wire guard access to uh, some hardware on a land here but that is definitely something i can can look at and uh, see if i can get it going Okay. And where we left off, it there were some benefits on Intel, but then it simply blew up on on AMD. So well, that'll be awesome. important. Go ahead. Uh, the request was for a uh, Hyper-V compatible solution. Is that correct? That is correct. And then down the road, a KVM pair of virtualized clock solution. Okay. I believe... Uh, Vitelli's code was for uh, Hyper-V, if I'm not mistaken. When I looked at the spec, it didn't seem terribly complicated. Um, but I really need to check again. It's, okay. it's been pretty much more than a year, actually. True, but I don't think his work has changed in a year because he's been tied up with Save Restore. So go ahead and look at that code. Come up with a statement of work, if you could. And let's just, you know, see what it would take to wrap it up on Intel and AMD and uh, of obviously the target is also Illumos and FreeBSD. So yeah, well the, cool. the question really is if there's anyone willing to fund this work, do they prefer to have it on FreeBSD or would they want it on Illumos? I um, do know some very kind folks on in Illumos land who uh, got quite excited about this long ago last round. But uh, go ahead and work on a statement of work on. Collectively, we'll sure. take it from there, okay? Okay. Fantastic. Uh, John, I know you've got your hands full. Any progress on LibNFS? Um, nothing worth speaking of. Understood. The guy working on it got redirected last week, so it's been very slow. Bummer. Understood. So I think we each have our little projects. Uh, Goran has... Uh, LibNV work, but he's still a few weeks out on that for a tour. Uh, I don't have a lot to report. Uh, short of I've been sticking my nose into Windows virtualization on top of Beehive, and I am quite pleased with what I've seen, and I've even gone back to the original uh, pre-GOP UEFI strategies to re-roll a Windows server install image with auto, auto unattend.xml. And on an old laptop, it just opens up that ISO, copies in the file, re-rolls it and boots it and rinses and repeats. And it's really reliable. I'm delighted with that. So I will keep tinkering with that. And thank you to your colleague, Andrew, Mark, who provided some additional resources. So let's just 
outside of this call coordinate on that. Um, what else? I know for those who care about process supervision, Jan, you've set us all in motion and we've got Jan and Schmidt and myself looking at how to just make that user friendly. So stay tuned for information on that. So and I can talk about I, what I intend to uh, please. the interface to look like. Okay, so uh, because um, S6 as RC is quite nice from an engineering point of view, but a bit hard on the user because you see it all. And the idea is just to put a front end in, um, before it in the form of a FreeBSD RC.D script so that you can just say the create a new Beehive uh, VM and then the services are instantiated for you. And you only have to get the templates right once because ba basically every Beehive guest from the service management point of view looks the same. Uh -huh. uh, so there is no, not the usual problem that you have to write a vast, uh, rewrite a la vast list of services. Like if you wanted to use it as your generic uh, init system replacement, you can just use it for the services you care about. I have written the helpers to make uh, item potent uh, interface configuration uh, easy to use. So that I can just say, uh, I want a bridge of this name to exist. And I want a interface cloned from this cloner, let's say top or the Mnet or potentially something else, anything but ePair because ePair is a special uh, uh, case. But so you can just say, I want to have a bridge name, bridge VMs to, uh, and I want a, top interface named uh, top VM zero. And I want the top interface to be a member of the bridge. And I want the bridge to be up. And you do that and then busy every step of the way, uh, the script uh, checks if the state is already uh, in place. If not, it, it tries to uh, do the cha state change. The problem is that some of these changes aren't atomic, for example, Creating and renaming an interface in FreeBSD are two steps. While well, you can do it in one IF config invocation, uh, the IF config command isn't atomic. So it can happen that you could allocate the next three tap device, but the name is blocked at the time it tries to rename, then it fails and gives you the name of the interface it left around. But uh, now you are in charge of cleaning up. So I do that and after what I recheck if there was a race condition, maybe the other one succeeded. Uh -huh. And uh, if I just emit a warning and uh, let it succeed, if not, um, I uh, still destroy the uh, unwanted because it couldn't take the right name tap interface. And then yeah, if everything is possible, you have your configuration. If not, it failed. Okay. Uh, if it can't uh, accomplish the request, it will undo anything. If it can't undo it, it just screams and gives up. Because if a destructor fails, you're just out of luck and there's nothing you can do. Is I, It sounds like that's not yet ready for the outside world to poke at. Oh, that script is ready to use. It's really just a bit of shell. Different from what you've sent me last round, or may I take a look no, at it? No, this this interface script I mentioned. Oh, okay. Oh, for the yes, uh, build up and tear down or clean yeah. up, build up. But oh, then the SXRC and The important part is that you basically specify the state you want the system to be in uh, on success. And it attempts to bring the system or tells you that it's already done and nothing had to be changed. Um, yeah, that's okay. it. Uh, I am happy to stick around after this call, especially if we end early. So uh, that is exciting. Do keep us posted. I am interested in that whole topic, regardless of the exact implementation we end up with. Other topics, questions, ideas, funny jokes. Looks like Antrenig, who's tied up with a Capture the Flag event, is uh, not available to join. He's a busy boy. Since and... none of his uh, victims are here, 
Uh, one of the quite horrific details I stumbled across is that the FreeBSD kernel basically only requires interface names to fit uh, into 16 bytes with zero termination and uh, to be unique and not empty. So you can put arbitrary crap in your interface names. Right. From backtick rm dash rf slash star backtick, that's a valid interface name, to ASCII control uh, characters like backspace to overwrite an interface name. Uh, you can even put in stuff like uh, different kinds of UTF-8 white space sequences like uh, zero with space so that you can copy and paste the interface name but you can't uh, type it in <laughs> again so if you really want to mess for someone yeah now okay, that's a that said um at what point is that a vulnerability for lack of a better term it becomes one uh, for example let's say i name uh, my interface name of another interface space name of yet another interface and suddenly if something uh, uses normal not very carefully written shell uh, scripts it will just split them up or it even worse it may uh, put them into an eval and then the back ticks get executed uh, stuff like this and um, the it's less of a vulnerability as a uh, it's basically impossible because the networking tools do not have support for outputting uh, null byte separated uh, lists. So there's no uh, clean way to deal with such interface names because you have a random mixture in these tools between uh, mostly space and white uh, space and uline as field separator, sometimes maybe top. But basically, your default IFS value must not be uh, in uh, the interface name because then you can't really pass it anymore. Uh, um, let me just make sure I heard you correctly. The interface name can include the the IFS separator. Yeah, it's anything for. Uh, hey. So basically, the default IFS uh, values like uh, space top new line, and hmm. um, those really should not be under any. Uh, circumstances be allowed into interface names, in my opinion, unless all the tools are extended to uh, still support uh, listing them and accept lists of uh, null byte separated names. Because otherwise, you just can't recover from that. This might warrant a blog post, for lack of a better term, on just the uh, Hilarious until terrifying things you can do with that. I mean, the narrative yeah, to date has been, oh, you can use a poo emoji, ha ha. But this is a little more nefarious. The poo emoji that. doesn't hurt you because it exactly. doesn't break the uh, field separation and passing. Yeah. Uh, the other problem is that 15 bytes uh, is just not uh, 15 usable because the 16 is blocked by the null byte. Just aren't enough to give them a reasonable tenant and virtual machine uh, identifier uh, so that you can embed uh, reasonably long names. So uh, yeah, that's just annoying. Either you have to not put enough information in there. Let's say you can't tell, for example, which side of an e-pair it is. Mm -hmm. um, you, so either you have to restrict you to yourself to a handful of characters of useful namespace or uh, you have to give up on embedding the stuff and then I really don't want to give up on embedding uh, names because embedding avoids mapping which is uh, racy and just a pain in the posterior yeah oh, what's the length of that value it all has to fit into 16 bytes right thank you 15 of those are usable because the last one has to be the uh, Null byte to terminate okay. the C string. Uh, so okay. yeah, I understand that it's probably copied and, and may blow up a few uh, kernel uh, struct sizes if we raise it too far. But can we just move it out of the way so that it gets its own cache line and raise it to 64 bytes or something? Right. 
it's but, not in the, it shouldn't be in the hot path for anything so it just has to uh, get out of the way i would even prefer to have it twice as much 128 bytes or something so that you really can put in basically uh, what kind of interface is it what scope is it in and uh, well if you want your human... interface name to contain a ui a uuid it has to be longer uh, yeah, it well, depends on the format of UUID, but I did, don't want to put in the UUID. Uh, I want to put in uh, something like, yeah. Under, understood. I'm simply saying bridge, that because there are uh, applications out there that use UUIDs for bridge yeah. names, for instance. Yeah, it's a valid yeah. name. Uh, even if you just, uh, uh, let's say you're 15. Two to the power of <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, so um, that's not enough. Yeah, John and Jan, do you feel some of these characters should be illegal? Flat. Well, that's I guess the term illegal and not supported by the kernel, just so you can't. Um, I don't know. Hide so some I would nefarious, really nefarious want the kernel to Go refuse ahead. one of the values commonly found in IFS. I can see that it makes sense to support uh, spaces and in interface names if they are presented in uh, some kind of graphical user interface. It's a bit annoying to deal with, but it's easy. But I really want the kernel to deny uh, tabs and new lines and in interface names. It's just ridiculous. Mm. What about the backspace? Well, I'll, I'd flip this. Uh, you might flip this around and say um, it's possible to support stuff, but if we do, rc.subber needs to, or rc.network, uh, rc.subber need to support it. And I've the already run is, into a case hold on, let him finish, where I, let him cannot, finish. I cannot create a bridge and dynamically rename it and have it work uh, because the way they store variable information. Um, it should work because anything not allowed in a shell variable name is removed is, re uh, is replaced with underscores in the mm, variable I name. I can so, I can put a dot in there and it doesn't work. Yeah, you have to name the variable. Uh, then uh, the used to be a dot. You put in an underscore and then it should work mm. for the variable name in shell. Uh, um, unless you happy found to try a, again, but it didn't work. So so underscore dot have, or what? Or escaped in some way? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a lossy process. It's not proper escaping. It just okay. replaces anything not allowed in a shell variable name oh, and underscore. Okay. There's a hard part in that in the to basically it's ugly code because you it has to use eval. So basically, it looks at the variable uses a glob, I think, to find anything which yeah. is not allowed. Uh, then re rewrites that, and afterward, it basically doesn't. Uh, print f e uh, with the name so that it can get the verbal by uh, name. We uh, already have a set var in our business. I'm, I'm, so I'm still going to I'm still going to disagree with you. Okay. Because oh, point. when you when you do a create, it wants the the name is going to come in and then you issue the name option on the create and mm -hmm. the RC code is remembering the pre pre renamed name. Um, what you have to do is you have to create the interface and then assign its name using if config underscore uh, or interface underscore name to have it come I, back I and rename it. Under I understand. Uh, it may be that, that it Jan, doesn't what's work the around? Cases, uh, because it really it is fragile. It is a stringly type mess. What's the workaround? You like give both the original uh, the name and the new RC. name? The rc.conf main page explains yeah. uh, okay. if you search for underscore name, how to do it. But it's uh, really something. Just keep it to a reasonable set of characters and uh, it works. But the problem is that there is no support for dynamically creating a renamed interface in the uh, not I have script. So you have to create it under a static uh, cloner and index and then rename it. Okay. Which is 
Uh, Hans and Andrew, we have you at the table with Illumos Experience. Are there illegal characters that are forbidden in Illumos interface names, or can you even rename them in the first place? You're allowed to laugh at us for this because it sounds like it's very ridiculous. Go ahead. That's I've really never. I was going to say I've never tried to enter anything bizarre into my interface name, so I don't know. Okay. So it doesn't even have to be something bizarre. Let's say you want to name it uh, Beehive colon space uh, guest name or something. Or you can definitely rename interface names. Okay. You yeah. Can do that. Uh, I have no idea what could be in there, what's legal or not. I mean, I think that the interface name that the kernel keeps is just informational value. It's probably showing up in some case sets, but even then there's fixed length strings probably. So in general, I would expect there could be anything in there. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the real problem is that there is no way to get a list of interfaces uh, so that you can uh, reliably split them because there is no reserved value as field separator. Well, there is in FreeBSD, but a way to do that in Lumos, except of course, if the field separator is a new line and you have a new line in your name, yeah, that might you can do that in FreeBSD. You can put new lines in, you can put anything, you can, can put in any up to 15 character C string <laughs> in there, it just has to be unique. The, the, the thing is, no, what, what are you trying to achieve and uh, what method are you... I'm trying to uh, write a reliable uh, abstraction which does not leak and basically can take arbitrary input and arbitrary system state where the, which the system could be in and work covers all cases correctly. I just want my yeah. scripts to not fall apart. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing, you're saying you're doing this in script. So in, in Illumos, you would probably use um, utilities like DLADM yep. for that. And that has an option to uh, give you possible output. Um, mm -hmm. if, you're using, if you're using the zone interface for controlling, um, you can actually put it in there and it automatically creates the uh, interface when it comes up. And that's usually what we do. We got away. From, we started using the DL Adam uh, to create it initially, but once they added that feature, we went to use that because, yeah, it yeah. seems to be better in every way. The DL Adam uh, is data link or something. From the administration, system. you could use yeah, the it, link or something. Yeah, it's uh, used, it's used to create VNX and and mm -hmm. all the all the various additional things around that. I looked into doing it in C. The problem is that, um, yeah, it's a bunch of low-level under-documented IOctals where a reference code to speak to it is in a library which is private to the IF config command. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's because libif config exists, but it's mostly a helper to uh, invoke the IOctals. And yeah, it's... It definitely... Uh, C you can do it and uh, just do the octals yourself and basically detrace what the if config command does and then we write the equivalent C code. Okay, Hans, you had something. Yes, um, we we definitely have a library to do these things, and um, but I don't know offhand what its name is. <laughs> Probably something like the LADM or something. The so, problem is the library is just a statically linked library, which is only linked into uh, um, AF config. It isn't even installed. Hmm. Uh, it's just an implementation detail of IF config, as far okay. as I can tell. Okay. I'll lip what the I... two OSs here. Uh, okay. Uh, John, I will. Copy your comment. You've dropped in some syntax. Let's see. That is either the desired or undesired. The useful, but leaves blah, 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 blah. confused. Okay, got it. 
um, cool. Um, I would love to see a some form of napkin notes or blog post documentation on the uh, horrible things you can do with interface naming on both OSs because I I don't know John do you have any thoughts on the malicious interface name that happens to include rm rf slash simply because you can slip in some new lines and backspaces and you name it uh, my immediate answer is I think we should probably uh, put some code in there to restrict the interface names to something that's approved. Yeah, uh, it's sanitizing it seems the right course of action here. There's just too much stuff. So something really nasty, for example, you can do is you can uh, put it. So for example, the same problem also applies to group names, which have the additional restriction that oh. they must okay. not end with a um, decimal uh, digit, but you can end them with a, a decimal digit, a, a backspace and a space. Interesting. So you can uh, kind of make it look like it is, ends with a it, but, or just put uh, all with interface name ending in a digit plus a, a UTF-8 uh, zero with space character. Okay. Uh, well, so it's not that it just looks like it and uh, good luck. Yeah. Uh, how uh, I, I'm, I guess I'm glad the attackers of the world haven't listened to this conversation, but I think so. The problem is that some little red all of this here. requires super user permissions. Mm -hmm. If you have a right to conf set this confusing stuff up, you've already won because you already wrote on the host. Fair and enough. Nothing yeah. matters, basically, unless mm -hmm. you have a very... Uh, deep well, idea. having the ability to have these different types of interface names breaks POLA, especially when you're doing an ifconfig-l. So yeah. I, my consideration is it's if it, it ought to be... It should, it should have a, a, a bug entered against it, in my opinion. While That's talking defined. about POLA violations, ifconfig-l prints a space separated list of interface names, ifconfig dash L uh, dash G group name prints a new line separated lists of interfaces in that group. Right, you just recently mentioned that insofar as the it's, listings are, are yeah, reported differently. Okay, so is it, where is that documented? Nowhere. Okay, repeat that, is ifconfig dash L and what's the other one? It's a space separated, it uh, returns a space separated list yep. of all uh, interfaces. And then what's the other listing for groups? Uh, and you can filter that by group, dash yeah. L, dash G, group name, or I think dash uppercase G to exclude a group. Yeah, and then it becomes new line separated? Yes. Oh, hello. Okay. The fact that the response to that question was nowhere Please. means there at least needs to be a bug entered for documentation to be written. Amen. Um, okay. At least I haven't found it anywhere. It may be hidden somewhere, but it's the problem is we can't fix that because the old inter this behavior has been there for ages. Uh, people have written scripts depending on the exact output because there isn't anything better. Yeah. And so you can't change the output without breaking someone's automation, which is why fconfig is such an uh, yeah annoying tool to improve. It's not just well, it's not that the yeah. code is so bad, but that you can't fix a lot of the low hanging fruit because it will break someone's stuff. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you can always improve the documentation. Amen. Oh yes, that you can, but. Um, I still think oh, in this went, limbo uh, between over. 14 release and the future, it's good to have these conversations and think, well, we've been doing it dumb for decades. Let's try to improve, be it docs or code or both. So very good point there. And Jan, you had touched on a lot of these and I, you have a great sense of these in their logical conclusions. So thank you for that. <sighs> Goran, anything on this topic? Yeah, I'm cornering you. <laughs> no, no. 
<laughs> okay. I, I didn't think about it. That's cool. Hey, interface naming. That's what I wake up thinking about late yeah, at night. It's, it's an annoying little detail. Uh, yeah, it's but if it gets some... malicious, yeah, I granted they would have to be uh, rude, but the still. Problem is, it's less that it's malicious. You expect it to be malicious. It's just that I found out that there is no way for me to do it correctly without writing a C code, which yeah. does the iOctals itself, because with the command line interface cannot be uh, data transparent because it. it lacks both quoting and a reserve value. So there is no way to have uh, this work out correct. Okay, that said, anything else today or shall we get on with our lives and talk next week? Well, I is, will call is it. Is there a plan? <laughs> Go ahead. Are Andrew. we planning on having a meeting next week? Is that a holiday, by the way? Uh, next week is when Thanksgiving falls for those of us in the uh, United celebrate. States. Yeah, which with profound irony is sometimes the absolute best time for people to meet because they're not in the office or it's the worst time because they've got like, you know, tables full of food. So, uh, John, you're in North America. What are your thoughts on attempting to meet on Thanksgiving? Um, I I actually personally am okay with it because of the way my Thanksgiving plans are working. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let me think about it. Andrew, is it uh com conflicting for you? You'll be going full Betty Crocker. If, if every if you all want to have a meeting, I'm not going to be upset by it, but I also am not going to attend. Okay. I have family. Excellent stuff yeah. Understood. So, well i never okay. want these meetings to be stressful such that get your agenda item in there we might discuss it watch the video and you didn't have to raise a finger so uh well let's i'll let me think about it play it by ear uh being in the morning my time it's not so intrusive but i can see how for others it's uh getting into turkey time so if you're interested, I can give you a little bit of information on something I tried to do, which did not work, uh, but I am not actually asking for any help to debug it or anything. Uh, your observations have been extremely insightful to date. So yeah, let, let her rip what you got. <laughs> oh, you say that. <laughs> um, there are no failures, only science. Exactly. Only science when you record for results. Exactly, and then otherwise just messing around. Go ahead, John. <laughs> so I just wanted to report that I attempted to bring up a... Um, so uh, a Dell R750 uh, has two uh, ConnectX uh, 6 uh, 100 gigabit cards in it. Uh, two 25 gigabit cards for the host OS, the 100 are for the VM public. Um, I attempted to generate 28 uh, pass-through devices, uh, 14 per card uh, on the 100 gigabit on port one on each card. Um, generate those directly into pass-through mode. I am not trying to use uh, SRM. Any, any the tooling to uh, move them back and forth because that failed hmm. or it does not work correctly, which I've talked about previously. And um, with those 28 ports, the actual incoming lines are uh, 100 gigabit cable per card in port one of the 100 gigabit cards. Um, I then take, uh, after generating the pass-through devices, I am generating and passing into the VM a pair of, of uh, SRIOV uh, virtual function devices. Those show up in the VM, and if I boot a single VM up with those devices coming in, I can configure those in a lag with in failover mode, and everything works fine. Um, when I bring up uh, three or more, so if I bring up two, it works. If I bring up three or more, 
um, if I have no pause between bringing the VMs up, then the system locks up. If I pause approximately 30 seconds between each VM startup, then I can bring three VMs up. After three, it's a random chance if it works at all. Um, and if I, for instance, bring all 14 up simultaneously, even with a 30 second timeout, uh, the system locks up, but good. Um, there is no output on the terminal, their console. There is no output on the serial console. Um, the system requires a hard reboot to recover. Um, now I'm going to say the thing that kind of hurts to say it the most, but I'm, I'm going to, if I take that same system and I put uh, Linux uh, QEMU KVM on it um, and use the IOV uh, driver over there, it comes up and works beautifully. So we've, we have bugs um, and I, I don't even know where to look for them yet. Um, but that's a status of trying to bring a system like that online. Do you get an error out of that or simply locks up, have a nice it's day? A, you're it done. is a complete lockup. Ew. There are no errors. I cannot, I can't break into a kernel debugger. It's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm suspecting there's something in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh Mellanox driver, um, that's wrong, but as of right now, I, I don't know. If it was just the Mellanox interrupts, it shouldn't lock up the system that badly unless it completely breaks interrupt handling, which is what I it sounds don't like. Dis I don't disagree with you. Uh, so it may also be that the uh, IO uh, MMU is com uh, not completely supported. Uh, are these uh, the, these are Intel CPUs, right? These are what? Intel or Intel AMD. CPUs? They're Intel systems. Um, okay. Just making sure because because we've we... had major issues on the AMD IOMMU. Just saying. Ooh. Um, Go ahead. One of the things, uh, even under Linux, which could become a problem of using a failover like that, is that. Uh, normally, the ZIO uh, pass-through devices are limited to only their own MAC address, so they cannot be, become promiscuous uh, or change their MAC address, which is what you have to do for link aggregation to work hmm. uh, in, in the form of LACP. I don't use LACP. LACP. You mentioned yeah, and failover. still, if right. you want uh, the layer 2, basically, uh, identity of the system to fail over to, as well, uh, then you have to assign the same MAC address to both interfaces in the failover pair. It uh, works. Well, John, yeah, does that work without works, lag? But it will be, has confusing uh, implications if the MAC address changes, because then the failover isn't transparent at uh, layer two. You may, for example, get a new DHCP uh, lease assigned and cannot renew your old one uh, inside the virtual machine. If John, does that work without GPL. lag? Sorry to just... uh, Yeah, you can have a, a lag interface in failover mode, for example, right. in FreeBSD. But uh, if the interface is... So I don't, I don't uh, have that problem. Yeah. Well, hold on. And okay. inter to in clear. internal to the VM, I can assign the MAC address however I want it to look. Just make sure that if you want them to be in a layer 2 failover configuration, whether uh, link LACP for... Uh, dynamic or just active passive, uh, all member interfaces in, of the failover interface uh, group have to have the same MAC address. It's even worse if you have a, a round robin or act, some kind of other active active load sharing, because then um, you get complete chaos. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, just... Uh, I've been there and it's not fun to debug. Oh, I completely yeah. agree with you. Even John. worse, uh, if you really want to break the system, have your uh, LDP uh, announcer uh, use the old Mac address and then basically pull over the 
the um, active failover pair to the uh, failed interface again. It works for a few seconds, then it doesn't. That's uh, something which will, if you encounter this, and it will drive you up the walls. I repeat that last one, Jan. What happens? Every... Uh, LDP, uh, oh. Link Discovery Protocol. LDP, okay. sorry. Um, um, it's a protocol to where a switch can yeah. say, this isn't the name I assigned the port you're connected to and something like this. And I'm not just a switch, I'm also a router. And this is the IP of my management address and stuff like okay. this. And the host can say, uh, I'm this class of device. This is my host name. I named my interface this and this. And this is quite useful. Okay. Got it. Got but it, got the it. problem is uh, it does also the problem is if basically the uh, your LLDP announcements are sent on the member interfaces because you want to send them on both of uh, your LACP interfaces. What happens is uh, even on a uh, failover, you want basically all the interfaces to announce to the switches uh, how what is the interface name on the server and stuff like this. Uh, but the problem is that if you don't assign the MAC addresses uh, for the source for the announcement correctly, the switch will learn the a MAC address of the bridge, uh, or sorry, of the bridge, of the failover interface, flapping back and forth between the active and the inactive interface, and then packets received on the inactive interface get dropped and stuff like this. Uh, which, yeah. Okay. It will drive you crazy. <clears throat> John. Because as soon as you send the next packet of, on the right interface, it falls back. So you have a fraction of a percent of packet loss under load, but under okay. no load, you have seconds of unreachability in there, ah. and it fails. The uh, it you can still do things with TCP. It just every it locks up for a few seconds every once in a while, and then oh. it continues. And every the of course the latency distribution looks terrible because you have these lost packages which trigger uh, congestion control. And yeah, it's, and off uh, you go. Okay, not I get it. Fun I get it. to debug. <laughs> Yeah. Just don't do it. <laughs> okay. John, but, can you spin up more than two or three VMs with the failover lag disabled? Or is it regardless? Sounds like no, it hangs only, before this he only gets with a the, This is only with... Go uh, ahead. I am talking about bringing up a system yep. that has 28 VFs defined, 14 yep. per card. Yep. And that's my lockup mode. Prior to network... Uh, configuration on the VM itself. I am going to say during network configuration. Okay. That said, have you tried it without any form of link aggregation on the VM? If Does it even I get turn, that far? I... That's the question. Let's see. Do you get that far? Or you don't if, get that far. If I if I use the VFs, it will lock up regardless of whether I'm using any form of lag. Ah, good. thank you. Thank if, you very much. If okay. I turn around and allocate tap devices and don't use VFs, it works correctly, but it is slower, obviously. Yeah, sure. That's okay, great. thank you. Uh, um, John, a question. If you can, are in a position to test this, can you try basically creating them just the, with I, uh, IOV uh, control? Does that work? That's what I'm doing. So is that the step which fails or once Beehive is started and starts using them? When I start Beehive and the VM starts bringing the VF online. Okay, so if you just, but you get into the VM bootloaders. So the bootloaders do not trigger that? No, the bootloaders do not. Okay. I know I'm booting a Linux system underneath it. Okay, so, and the interesting part it would be now to find out if it's, happens when the driver is loaded or when the interface is administratively up um, or on the first packet or, but yeah, that would kind of limit when it explodes, but the actual misconfiguration of course may have been created earlier. So there is a sample of the IOV control file used for mm -hmm. MCE2 the and the one for MCE4 looks identical except for the device name. Out of curiosity, you you do not pass through the first because you probably want that for the host, right? That is correct. Does and have it you make tried a, a FreeBSD VM first... or anything else? Just 
for kicks? No, I have not. Uh, if Sorry. you can, spin one up and see if it I, just for what it's worth. The other question I have <laughs> it's is, just time. does it matter if, the, if you re, uh, put uh, the first into a pass through mode or not? I uh, apologize, say that you, again. Does it also happen when you put all of them, including the first uh, VF0, uh, into pass through mode? I have not tried that. Because it could be that the vendor didn't test that and just tried to, to have the left machine with all the um, VFs passed through and said, yeah, it works, and didn't test this configuration. Because that's the production configuration, not the does pass through work that's configuration. Valid point. <laughs> It's a bit of a meta debugging uh, strategy, but of course, so there are two I totally agree that it should work all the minutes. time, and uh, that this is really uh, something which is a total uh, blocker. Yeah. Um, for what it's worth, maybe indeed, no one thought you'd ever skip the first interface, and for what it's worth, try a FreeBSD VM, and despite appearances, we would love to help you debug this and get it working. So do let us know how we can help and you. Please, please file a bug report for it. I'm sorry, do a what? Oh. File a <laughs> bug report. Yeah, bug report, I, can, uh, I, I don't just... like filing bug reports for something that I can't recreate, so to speak, and mm -hmm. give information about. Well, can you try those two things? Skip the first interface, try a FreeBSD VM, and then send me some really expensive network <laughs> interface cards to try it with in the lab? Ha! Um, <laughs> I wish I know. <laughs> um, I, I might, it, it all depends. It okay. might be a number of weeks before I can do this again because I'm the hardware that I was doing this on is going production and oh, I'm boy. waiting on another shipment to come in. I see. Okay. I don't, Let's... I don't have permanently allocated, um, I don't have hardware permanently allocated that I can just use if that makes any sense. I hear you. Okay, we've covered mm -hmm. some really good ground, uh, even if mundane and simultaneously terrifying. Any other topics while we're at it, or shall we potentially reconvene next week? I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, I remember I ported Salesforce VPN. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you tell? Since yesterday, it has a RCD script, so you can sort it more easily. Now, next on my agenda for for that endeavor is to try. Uh, there's a repo with IBM's uh, examples of um, programs doing different stuff with a TPM. Okay. And uh, next on my agenda is to dissect their what they call the proxy because the Beehive in this uh, scenario is going to be a proxy between the virtual machine TPM client and uh, software TPM. So okay. that's what I'm going to research next and hopefully have something that at least works in a one C file and okay. then see how to integrate that into Beehive. That is great news. Godspeed on that one. Let us know how we can help. And... I think uh, it should be uh, TPM, not TMP. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Uh, 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 either that's me or the auto carrot. Thank you for that. You are correct. <laughs> TPM. Thank you. You have a link Good to eye. that? Yeah. Or is that not yet? Uh... Well, the IBM uh, obviously has a link, and there's your port. So yeah, shoot us what you have. Yeah, it's it's already in the port, and uh, I would have to dig up the IBM link. Uh, hopefully, what you happened? can add it later, but I don't know where it is now. Oh, uh, just one sec. IBM TPM GitHub it might not be too. Pardon. Uh, this is see, a user yeah. space. Oh, is that Kay Goldman, perhaps? Hold on, it's good. No, no, no. Give me a second, maybe I found it. Possibly that. 
And then let's look for demo. Uh, as a group. Give me a second. Yep. So from the big fat maybe department, uh, this is the user space TSS oh four TPM two point Okay, so this is nope, maybe not. where I'm obviously playing with it and experimenting. Uh, where I got right now is um, uh, TPM has two channels: control and data channel. I know uh, how. Go on, your audio is coming and going. Do you have any control? Oh ah, damn it! <laughs> you're a okay, bit so... muffled yeah it's like you're on a swing <laughs> it's kind of cool uh, I know how to initialize control channel but still not how to talk to data channel so that's basically it okay um... And I guess actually you were almost right about the link. I grab it as like wrong so, true project, I think. Well, this is one of the simplest TPM commands. Okay. And And this is the proxy. Got it. Let me drop those in there. Just one sec. Thank you for those. Copy. Uh, so command. Uh, which one's more exciting? Let's look at this one. Well, There's the we're proxy. Actually we're actually going to need a proxy. Okay. Uh, but in my research while I implementing it, I'm going to need a command to proxy, actually. So uh, I chose the, actually, I didn't choose anything. I asked uh, SWTPM author what to use. And he said, PCR read is one of the simple ones. So okay. start with that. Has Corbin been helpful? Um, well, I don't want to say no. He, he's not unhelpful, but I still didn't get to the part where I need to ask something. Okay, and fine. Well, well he's, uh, he's a resource within reach, and I'm glad you reached yeah. out to the original author. Well, uh, I, for one, am excited about that code. And uh, I, I welcome your progress and updates and requests for assistance. Anything else? Well, gang, I'm happy to call it. I'm happy to stick around a little bit afterwards. And I wish you a fantastic week and weekend. Thank you Let's very much. Celebrate it. I hope everyone has a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much.